God's grace and his peace be unto you from the God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking at the last part of the Lucan Gospel, so feel free to actually open your Bibles, go to the latter part of Luke, and follow along with me. I'm going to tell the story rather than read it, because I already told you half of it, and sometimes stories are better told in the first person. So there they are, Cleopas, his friend, a disciple, and again, I, I cleared up that not one of the original 12, but one of the disciples. There are many more disciples than the, the original 12, and we need to know that. And in Luke, the gospel writer of Luke says, there were lots of women disciples, and in fact, it's their money that supported this whole operation. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But there are many disciples, and we are, of course, among those disciples. They didn't recognize Jesus. They didn't recognize him. But then, they met with their friends, and as they're having supper, Jesus breaks the bread, and he gives thanks, and he offers the bread to the people at table, and the gospel writer says, their eyes were open, and they realized it was the Lord. Now, there's a slight change here, because when they were talking about Jesus on the way to Emmaus, they said he was a great prophet. When he opens their eyes, when he has communion with them, they change their language, and he's not just a great prophet. He is the Lord. That happened to Thomas last week, if you were listening. That Thomas was totally depressed. His Savior had died and wasn't going to save him or redeem the people of Israel. But when Thomas put his fingers in Jesus' side when he saw the nail prints in his wrists. He changed and he said, Lord. And he fell on his face and he worshiped Jesus. I don't know why we call him Doubting Thomas. I'd like to call him one of the first disciples who really knew that Jesus was God. Well, that's the gospel story. And I encourage you to it's okay to read the Bible at home. It is. It's okay to uh, read your, your scriptures at, at home. Bibles are more than just coffee ornaments. They're more than just books that we take off and put on the coffee table when the preacher comes to visit us or our, or our righteous friends. Uh, it's okay to read these Bibles. What actually keeps us from seeing Jesus and knowing the truth? That's a rhetorical question. What do I really believe, and why do I really believe it? That's the ultimate question, isn't it? What do I really believe? What causes my heart to burn with fire? Because I know that this is a truth that is so incontrovertible that it's splendid. It changes my life. I saw a uh, writing on the internet the other day that if Carl Sagan would tell you that there are 30 billion stars in the universe, you believe him. But when you're walking around the church or some public building and the sign says wet paint, you just got to touch it. You just got to touch it to see if it's, if it's really wet. And one of my favorite theologians who talks about our belief structure in our faith, Hank Ketchum, who, who wrote those wonderful uh, cartoons about Dennis the Menace. I know most of you are too young to remember Dennis the Menace, and I know that the choir certainly doesn't remember Dennis the Menace. They did make a, a movie about Dennis, you know, a few years back. Okay, I like to see those noddings of the, of the heads. Well, so here's Dennis the Menace. He's in a corner. He's obviously gotten himself into some kind of trouble. And he looks back, and you can assume that it's his mother standing behind him. And Dennis says, who are you going to believe? 
Me or some old Sunday school teacher? Who are you going to believe? And, and, and why are we going to believe this very wonderful truth about the fact that God loves us? I hope you're not sitting there saying, well, yeah, I, I, I know that preacher. Tell me something I don't know. Because I'm here to tell you that not a day goes by in my life that I don't ponder the question, does Jesus really love me? Is there a God who really cares about me? That's the biggest question that we get to ask ourselves every day. And in Jesus the Christ with his dying on the cross and coming back? Well, the answer to that is yes. Jesus does love me. Well, who are you going to believe and why? I have taken the time and trouble to put in your bulletins, which I encourage you to take home, all of the resurrection appearances in our scripture. Take that home and study it this week. I love the squeaky floor. I'll, I'll try to stand somewhere else. But is that enough evidence? Are you going to believe that Jesus loves you because you've seen how many times he's appeared in the Gospels? I don't think so. I think we have to put on Jesus. We have to try Jesus. We need to see if he's working for us. To quote Dr. Phil, how's that working for you? And so we have to make a leap of faith. A leap of faith in which I say, I know Jesus loves me. And even though lots of weird, awful things happen to me, I forgot the combination in my locker. My junker car that my parents gave me won't start. That in spite of all these things, we live in a universe in which God cares about us and loves us. But we don't really find that in evidence. I can't prove to you that Jesus is Lord that Jesus is God. I can't prove that to you. You have to experience it for yourself. Make the leap of faith that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus does love me. And if you're having trouble with that, the Jesus I believe in will help you. I believe help my unbelief. That's what the centurion said to Jesus as he was getting ready to heal his servant. I believe, help my unbelief. And he will. Every time. Any time. But it's a daily process, isn't it? I believe in you, Lord. But there are times when I get, spec uh, not spectacle, but uh, skeptical. Sometimes I make a uh, spectacle of myself up here and I can get a laugh out of Melody, but the Lord is real. Paul says, put on the clothing of Jesus Christ and see what happens. One of my mentors in divinity school said, look guys, girls, half of us were girls, sometimes I forget. And that professor said, look, ladies and gentlemen, this Jesus is real. This Jesus is real. Try him. And he put out a challenge to us. He said, read your gospel books, either Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and I encourage everybody here, spend the next 10 years in those gospel books. It'll keep you plenty of things to read about. He said, try reading gospels every day and then pray to the Lord that you want your faith enhanced, that you want to grow. Try that for 30 days. 
And if it doesn't work, I will refund your seminary tuition for this semester. No one came back to this professor wanting their money back. Jesus doesn't expect much. Just reach out to him a little bit. Act as if he is the reality of this universe. Act as if he cares. Tom Long, one of my favorite uh, professors, once preached a sermon at Princeton Chapel in which he said, the God you worship is the God you get. If your God is this severe, judgmental patriarch with a clipboard who's watching your every move and checking off points whenever you make a mistake, if that's your God, what are you saying, Sandy? <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> Are there sound problems? <laughs> Diane's not here, so Sandy will have to be my, my surrogate. Normally, Diane will do one of these if, it, if it's coming to the end of when we'll listen. <laughs> is, is that your signal? <laughs> okay, we'll talk at lunch. <laughs> the God you worship is the God you get. If you would believe with me this week, that God loves us, that God accepts us, that God wants to assist us in our day-to-day -day lives through the power of Jesus Christ in his Holy Spirit. That's the God you'll get. That's the God I'll get. My closing story comes from uh, Ernie Pyle, who was a reporter during World War II. I know you guys aren't old enough to remember him. He was embedded, one of the first news people in the United States who was embedded with the troops during World War II. And he tells the story about a German who was captured. He was a POW. He had some wounds. And he was captured by the American forces. His first name was Fritz, and boy, was he scared. These are my enemies. They're going to torture me. They're going to hurt me. That's what I deserve. I've been killing them for the last two years. But instead, a remarkable thing happened. The chaplain came to Fritz, gave him some cigarettes. Yeah, talk about how helpful is that, huh? gave him some cigarettes, gave him some soap, gave him a toothbrush, assured him that the morphine shot that he was going to get from the doctor was just to deaden some pain so that we could uh, clean up some shrapnel wounds. He was scared. He didn't believe it. But then it came true. People who were American soldiers and doctors and chaplains were nice to him. And he started looking at his toothbrush and his soap and his cigarettes as if they were toys, and there was a delight on his face. I think that's where it is with us. We don't deserve much, do we? I mean, not really. I'm always running away from God and making bad choices. I hope that's no surprise to you. Those of you who know me know that that's true. But we're constantly making wrong choices. We're constantly saying stupid things. We deserve some punishment. We deserve some retribution. But instead, we get tooth powder and toothpaste and a roof over our heads. And we receive grace. Try that experiment with me this week or this month. Read into the Gospels every day. Act as if Jesus is more real than your beating heart. And see what kind of report you have at the end of this experiment. 
I've never seen it fail. Thanks be to God for his gospel, his grace, and his beloved son, Jesus.